Chapter 7, Ordering Methods. Uh, here we are with the elimination graph and the quotient graph and then the matrix. And all three represent the same thing. And remember, we've got this local greedy strategy. We basically want to say, okay, look, I've got this. In this case, this is what? An 8 by 8 matrix. And I want to pick the node of least degree. Or in other words, I want to pick the diagonal entry so that the pivot row and pivot column have the fewest number of non-zeros. Uh, and here, that number would be 3, right? Because this has 3, this is a degree 3, 3, 4, 6. So you don't want to pick node 7. That would cause the whole, almost the whole graph to fill in. Uh, 8 has degree 4, and so on. 10 has degree 3. You notice there's like, uh, on the order of, there's three nodes. Node 3, 4, 5, and 10 all have degree 3. So which do you pick? Well, if I was smart, I would pick node 10. I'm not smart. It's too hard to be smart. <laughs> Especially at 8.30 in the morning. I don't have enough coffee yet. Just on my first mug. Um, Picking node 10, if you notice here, is free in the sense that it causes no fill-in. Look at the clique here. Its neighbors already form a clique. All right. Well, the problem with that strategy is, is trying to, you know, say, for example, a strategy might be instead of, say, selecting uh, the node of least degree, select the node that causes the least fill-in. In that case, you'd pick node 10 because it causes no fill at all. That's a really good choice. Well, that has a, that's the hard, harder to implement. It is slightly better quality, but still a heuristic to pick the node of least fill. It's still not going to give you the optimal ordering. So a minimum degree is a good, good uh, choice instead in practice. So in this example, I've assumed that I can just pick the nodes from 1 to 10 and that, that the kth node at the kth step will be a node of least degree. And trying to decide between, you say we have two nodes of degree 3, and, and which one do we want to pick, uh, it's just almost essentially at random, okay, that the algorithm will just decide whichever ones it comes across first. There's really very little to be gained in deciding between, say, node 3 and node 4. They both have degree 3. Um, and now if I pick node 4, I cause a lot more fill-in than if I pick, I think I do here. Let's see. No, I, maybe not. Um, but trying to decide between two nodes of, of low degree, I guess node 5 has degree 4 here. I'm sorry. I said it had degree 3. It has 4. 1, 2, 3, 4 nodes are here. It's adjacent to. Anyway, so let's just assume that the node of least degree at the kth step is node k for this picture. So that's what you get here with the, the sequence of elimination graphs, quotient graph, and matrix. So if you were just to apply the algorithm to the elimination graph, it would be very slow and it'd take a huge amount of memory. Okay. By moving to the quotient graph and by using something called element absorption, so using one, the quotient graph, and two, using element absorption, uh, and also I discussed the idea. So element absorption, remember, says that if I have an, uh, an element, say, E1, and I pick node K, that's adjacent to element E1. This is, represents a clique of some number of nodes, right? Well, K will be adjacent to some other nodes and neighbors and such elements and nodes. Uh, a node K is, is adjacent to element 1, and then its adjacency list in the new graph will consist of all five of these nodes. So I don't need E1 anymore to represent the fact that these three nodes are in a clique because element K, the new element K, will say the same thing. So this is redundant, and so this gets el eliminated due to element absorption. Okay, the other thing that happens is, is that edges such as this, and there's no real name for this in, 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 the, in the book, but uh, pruning the edges out of the A matrix, and I use the calligraphic letters now to denote the pattern, 
Pruning this edge uh, is important as well. Um, that, that also trims up the space. I don't recall if, I, th I think this, the first two are sufficient to make the algorithm work in place. The quotient graph with element absorption. Uh, I'm not sure off the top of my head. I, have to, I, I don't think this is actually strictly required to, uh, let's see. No, it's not strictly required to make the graph work in place, but it's just a, appropriate to do at this point. Um, the reason why we can do these sorts of data structure manipulations is, and not pay an extra cost for them, these two right here, is because these five nodes right here, I don't want to circle them because then they look like elements. These five nodes, we've got some work to do for them. We need to go through those nodes and recompute their degree because they've changed. All the other nodes in the graph have not changed, so their degree hasn't changed. But these five nodes could have new edges, new neighbors. I mean, they all have this new neighbor, for example. All these, I'm sorry, uh, yeah. These four nodes now have this new, no, new neighbor over here. And so the degree of these all five nodes have changed. So I've got to go through all of these nodes i here. And I've got to visit a sub i. And, and in particular, if I wanted to find the degree, I would have to find the set union of the following for all these nodes i. And this is expensive. So you, you pick a node of least degree. How you do that, that's another story. We'll talk about that. We form the new element. So now I have an element k. I'll change this bold and I'll delete element e1. Okay, now I've got some data structure manipulations to do. I need to do that. So I need to change the data structure for all these five nodes. So I've got to go through all of those and I also want to compute the degree. So the exact degree is the size of the set union of all elements E for which E is adjacent to. So this node I has next to it, say, two elements now, K and E. So E sub I. Node i is represented by two lists. E sub i would be k, now an e2. And of course, I'd have to insert that. It's a new member. And a sub i, in this case, is empty. But say, suppose it's nodes you know, 3 and 7. These are, these are nodes. So node i is next, next to some other nodes. It's adjacent to nodes, and it's adjacent to some elements in the, in the quotient graph. Remember, the, this quotient graph has two kinds of vertices, nodes, if you will, just original nodes of the graph, and these clique representation objects called, I'm calling elements. I call them elements, uh, they're called elements because they, they harken back to uh, the notion of something called the finite element method. And in the finite element method, the matrix is a summation of small, dense submatrices. Well, those are just cliques. They could just as well be called cliques. I mean, we're computer scientists. We would like to call them cliques. But just historically speaking, uh, it's hard to change uh, the. So here's this first. So we, have, we, we would have to compute the set union of all my neighbor elements. And then union with all of my neighbor nodes. And if I, if I go through here and prune these, and the, the script A is disjoint from any script L, but these will not necessarily be disjoint from each other. I mean, I could easily have another node here. In fact, let me just move this node over here. That's quite possible to have, and we can't prune that. We can't remove that. Because E2 could have some additional connectivity here. And so what's, what's node i? I mean, node i would be connected to every node I've got drawn on that diagram. Right? Node i is adjacent to some original nodes, nodes 3 and 7. It's also connected to this node, 
twice, if you will, but it's still connected. You know, it doesn't matter if it's connected twice. These two nodes and those three nodes. And I, I can't prune this data structure, prune this representation any further. It's just like over here, I'm sure there's some examples um, uh, of that. We've got here, for instance, node six is in the intersection of three of these elements. We, ha we have to leave that in. We can't make that any cons more concise than it is right here. Okay. Because, for example, node 7 is next to node 5 and 6, but not to, well, node 7 is next to everything. That's, that's a bad example. Um, you know, node 5, for example, is adjacent to 6 because of element 3, but not adjacent to 4. In some ways, this adjacency idea now of, a, of the elimination graph is sort of a two-step thing. If you, if you think of a graph with nodes and ask, well, who are you connected to? Well, you just look at your neighbors, right? But with these cliques, with these elements, we have a, 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 a two-hop process. Are you connected via a path of length two where the second node in that path is an element. We're using the word node, sorry. So I have three nodes here, three nodes here, and an element. And this node i is connected to all six of them. And the degree of i is six. That's the thing I want to minimize when I say I pick the node of least degree. The degree of node i is not four. It's not three. It's six. So you have to, and you have to compute a set union because it's quite possible for, say, this to occur. And uh, there's nothing you can, well, whoops. That's a bad example. This can't occur. OK, because if this occurred, this edge wouldn't be there. So um, we have to recompute this degree somehow. And this is ex the, the, the whole point of the approximate minimum degree algorithm, as opposed to the exact degree minimum degree algorithm is that this is cost, this set union is the most costly part of the algorithm to compute. Which is kind of odd. You would think that manipulating this graph would be the hardest thing to do, but it's not. Manipulating the graph is actually quite fast. It's going th through these nodes and recomputing this degree. The exact degree, anyway, is very expensive. So we'd like to, to somehow reduce this cost because the only purpose, there's no purpose in computing this. We, except for one, pick the least of thereof. But that's just a heuristic anyway. Okay, this recomputation is not needed to represent the, the graph. All we've got to do is like pick the next best node. Pick the best node in the graph according to some metric. Here's a metric. This metric's expensive. Let's find a cheaper metric. Ideally, the, the metric would, would take no more time asymptotically than creating and updating this graph structure. Because when I picked node k, I had some work to do. I had to, to change things. So, um, so this is what, I guess I, I rewrote this in a different, well, I put i at the very end, which is probably just as simple. So this is, the exact pattern of a row and column. Now, this does, this set union does need to be computed once at least. When you pick node i as pivot, you've got to know who it's next to exactly. So you've got to do all the set union. But in updating the degree, that's what's expensive. So we want to talk about this approximate degree. But there's other things I want to talk about leading up to this. Okay, let's pretend that we just go ahead and compute this exact degree and then we pick the next thing of least degree. We still have to, we still have to manage this graph, this, manage this data structure, and how can we keep this data structure as pruned as possible? Well, I've talked about the quotient graph. I've talked about the element absorption idea and the pruning of A, which is not on this list. There's two more things that help this algorithm go much faster. One is indistinguishable nodes, which you've seen before with a different name, super nodes. Nodes with the same non-zero pattern. What happens to those? in the graph. They help out a lot. And mass elimination, which is sort of like a last minute, oh, I just found it just now, and then you're dead. 
you know, uh, a version of this one, indistinguishable nodes. So let's look at both of these. Indistinguishable, indistinguishable, <laughs> it's too early in the morning to say that. Okay, what happens in the graph, let's just think of the elimination graph. It's simpler, and then I'll look at the quotient graph. It's slightly, only subtly different. There's a subtle difference, it, it works out the same. Suppose you've got two nodes, I and J. And let me put I and J over here. Let's suppose that they have the same adjacency pattern in the graph. I mean, the rest of the graph is there, it's, it, but there's nothing else connected to node I and to node J. And so maybe, maybe I should draw this a different way. Let me draw this a different way. Let me draw them next to each other. That's the problem with the chalkboard. The chalkboard's two-dimensional. What I really need is an n-dimensional chalkboard. Uh, Ronnie, do you think you can do that for me next class? An n-dimensional chalkboard. You know, like a hypercube in n-dimensional space. I guess I'd need n minus one-dimensional chalk, right? Because you, you have a line and a surface. It's one less dimension. Okay. <laughs> All right, so we've got the rest of the graph here. Now, um, so how could node I and node J have the same non-zero pattern? It could happen at the beginning, or it could happen during factorization as well. This, of course, now at the moment is the elimination graph. Now, um, the key observation here is to notice that Let's suppose um, we eliminate one of these neighbor nodes. All right. um, what I'm going to basically show to you is that once I and J have the same non-zero pattern, they're going to keep that way until the point at which one of them is annihilated, at which point the annihilation of its peer is free with no fill-in at all. So you might as well do it then. In other words, once I and J take on the same non-zero pattern, they will maintain the same non-zero non pattern, both changing, but exactly the same way. And then when one gets annihilated, the other one might as well be annihilated right now, at that moment, for free. No extra fill-in, no extra change to the graph, it's gone. So here's, here's what happens. Suppose this node here gets eliminated. And it's next to some other neighbors. Well, if this node gets in eliminated, it would cause a clique. It would create a new clique of its neighbors, including I and J both. So now I and J are connected to these neighbors. So you see they maintain the same non-zero pattern in the elimination graph. And of course, then the same thing in the quotient graph. They maintain the same pattern. Whatever they have, I and J are the same. So they stay the same. Now. So that's what happens in, uh, in here. And so let's suppose now we, we come back to this example here. We have two nodes, I and J. As, as the graph changes, if they have the same non-zero pattern, they keep the same non-zero pattern. But what happens when one of them gets eliminated? So we pick one of least degree. So if, suppose we pick, it doesn't matter which one we pick, Suppose we pick node I of least degree. What's going to happen? Then a clique will be formed of its neighbors. There's the neighbors all of them. But wait now, well and J itself, I'm sorry, I left out J. I'm going, going a little too ahead of myself. So its neighbors are J and also all the neighbors of J. So J and its neighbors, J and all of its neighbors now form a clique. So if I eliminate node J right now at this very moment, I get no additional fill-in, because then that would make the neighbors of node J a clique. But the neighbors of node J are already a clique, including J itself. So if I have, I mean, J is not connected to anything else but its neighbors. And its neighbors are already a clique. So if I eliminate J, its neighbors become a clique, nothing changes. No new edges get created in the graph. And since no new edges get created in the graph, I might as well eliminate it now you know, it's not necessarily the node of least degree. Well, actually, it was. I'll, I'll prove it to you. Um, 
It may or may not be a node of least degree. I haven't proven it to you. It is actually a node of least degree. But also, more importantly, its annihilation causes no fill-in, so it's free. So you might as well do it now. Now the other observation is, even in the heuristic of let's pick the node of least degree, which is just a heuristic and we could break it. So I could just stop right here and say, well, I am going to follow the strategy of picking the node of least degree and then if there's a node such as J, I'll eliminate it now and it may or may not be the node of least degree, but that's just what I'm going to do anyway because it's heuristic. Okay, but in fact, node J will have a degree that is no bigger than the node of least degree. So when node I, I guess I, I'm sorry, you know what, I, I needed to edge between I and J. Otherwise they're not identical. That was a mistake. Uh, if there has to be an edge between I and J, otherwise node, the adjacency of I does not include J, but J does include I, and so they're different, you see, or something, you know, so they have to be, they have to include each other in their adjacencies. Um, so if you have to ask that, I guess, I guess the real thing to ask is, are node I and node J the same adjacency um, with an, also a neighbor between, an edge between them? Okay, because otherwise node J would not be uh, actually in this clique, but now it is. I'm sorry, I made a mistake there. Okay, now we have a, now when I eliminate node I, I create a clique of J and its neighbors. Otherwise, if this edge wasn't there, I would just create a clique of node I's and node J's common neighbors, but not J itself. Okay, minor twist there. All right, so when I picked, so here's the, key, here's the observation. And again, remember, this is just an observation about the heuristic, and I'm going to change the heuristic anyway. Okay. Um, but when I change the heuristic, what I say here about this is, will still be true. But let's look at the degree of node i and the degree of node j. Let's suppose I annihilated node i. That means if I pick node i, it's a node of least degree. And that degree was 5 in this picture. Well, what happens to the degree of a node? Well, when, when, I, when I have a node k, whose degree changes. How can it change? Well, it can have, the only thing that can happen is if I is eliminated, it could lose a neighbor, the one that's eliminated. So the degree of K could go down by one. And it can go no further down than by one because it loses the neighbor that was eliminated. Now, it could also gain a new neighbor. What if I is adjacent in the elimination graph to this node, but, and, and, and K is not? Maybe I is then next to, say, these two nodes and those, that third one. So I is next to K and also these other three nodes. When I is eliminated in the elimination graph, then this edge gets created because I create a clique between all my neighbors. So the degree of K could go up. But maybe this edge doesn't exist. Maybe the clique of I consists of a subset of the adjacency of K already. Like this picture here. K experiences then no fill-in, no new edges, no new neighbors for K. But K loses a neighbor. So the best thing that can happen to K, the, 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 the smallest degree it can have is decremented by one. Whatever degree it had before, it can go no smaller than the degree minus one. So and that's true then of any node in the graph. Any node in the graph, when you eliminate it one node, any other node in the graph, its degree at most can be decremented by one. So now we start out by saying, here's a node that eliminated of least degree. Now it was five in this picture. That means in the new graph, the smallest degree possible is 4. That's the smallest degree of any node I could have in the entire graph because 5 was the least and now, I, now any neighbor could go down by 1 at, at most. They could all go up, but it can have, I can't have any node of degree 3 in the graph. Well, look at this. The degree of J is 4 in this if, if J is 
identical to I. It's a member of this new clique, I. No new edges get added to J. No new neighbors to J. J loses a neighbor, I. So the, J, the degree of, uh, of J goes from 5, which is the degree of I, to 4 in the new graph. And nobody else in the graph has a lower degree than 4. It can't. So node J is a node of least degree. Now, not necessarily, there could be other nodes of least degree out there. There could be another degree of node 4 now in the new graph. I was degree 5 and it was the least. So there was no nodes of degree 4 in the graph because I was a node of least degree. That's why we picked it. Uh, but when this annihilation occurs, it's possible that this node here also, one of these other nodes that got modified, could have now a degree of node 4. But J has a degree of node 4. So I could pick it as a node of least degree. N next. So this is the idea then that once two nodes... So if I, if I pick it next, if I make that choice, then uh, the proof is complete. Then what happens is if two nodes take on the same non-zero pattern, they stay that way until one is annihilated and the other one just goes away immediately. Okay. So then why bother keeping track of I and J together? If they have the same adjacency list, if I, then if I look at I, I might as well be looking at J. I can't tell the difference between the two. So let's lump them together in the graph. Let's make this graph simpler and put I and J together in a supernode. Like this. If we find that they're identical. And then when the pair IJ gets chosen as the node of least degree, it really represents the two nodes. And I form a clique of its neighbors. So then I have a clique here. So the advantage of this is I have a smaller graph. If I can detect this efficiently, and the key thing is how to detect it efficiently. But if I can detect it efficiently and merge together nodes of identical adjacency into this pair or triple or four nodes or five nodes or 128 nodes or whatever, I mean 573, Nodes. It doesn't matter how big, it can get as big as you like. Uh, then these two nodes get folded together. Now there's some interesting questions of how we represent that in the data structure. Okay. How do you represent the fact that I have a node of really two nodes? Because when I annihilate this, or when I deal with this, I have to do something a, a slightly different here. I have to worry about, well, when I look at node i, it's... I, what kind of degree am I interested in? And am, I, am I interested in this degree or something else? It turns out I'm interested in, some, in another, a different kind of degree that um, uh, is called the external degree. And that's not on this list, but this is another notion. So this is the notion of indistinguishable nodes or supernodes. Okay, so now with this change, there's a slight twist to the notion of degree. Now the question is, what is the degree of node i? Once I detect this, what's the degree of node i? Well, the degree of node i and, and j is 5, right? Because the true, the actual degree of node i and j, oops, this should be a j. The degree of node i and j is 5. They're both next to 5 nodes. These four outside nodes, external to the pair, but they have a node inside. I mean, sorry, an edge inside, which I don't want to really represent. Okay. I could, I could still compute 5. I could still figure out that i and j have degree 5 because I could look at this node and say, oh, you're actually a pair. You're two nodes. So any m member of this pair has a degree of, of these four plus the size of this minus one. So it's five. It's easy to compute, but it turns out I don't, we, we, don't want, we don't want to do that. We get slightly better quality if we use something called the external degree of a node. So once we have 
indistinguishable nodes. Once we have supernodes, now we can think about the idea of an external degree. And here in the external degree, I'm going to call d sub i, and I have a, 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 I think I put prime on this. We ignore our, our peer. In other words, now the degree of i and j is 4, and because I, I, I want to ignore the fact that i and j have an edge between them. Now, if this continues, if I say merge together three nodes, i, j, and k, suppose I have i and j, and suppose I have another node, k, that I, that I detect that, oh yeah, k also has, this of course now is a different graph, but now I detect that i, j, and now, whoops, I keep forgetting, now node k has, and j, has a similar pattern. And I fold i, j, and k together. Now think about what each of these edges represent. The, each of these five edges to the pair i and j represents, in fact, two edges to both i and to j separately. Okay, so it's a single edge in the data structure, but in fact it represents two, edge, two edges in, in, the, in the true graph, which I'm not actually representing explicitly. Okay, so in other words, k is really connected to both i and to j in the, in the real graph. In the, in the true graph that's represented implicitly. So if I fold this together, if I say, oh look, i, j, and k, they're all the same. So if I fold this together, what's happening now to the internal structure of i, j, and k? They're all pairwise connected. In other words, internally, everybody's a clique. Internally, all the nodes that have indistinguishable non-zero pattern, if I look inside them, they form a clique. They're all pairwise connected to each other. And when I annihilate one, I'm going to annihilate all of them. So let's think about what this looks like in the matrix. Why, why would I be more interested in the external degree than the internal degree. Well, here's i. I'm just going to do i and, and j. Let me do k actually as well. So I suppose I now have these three nodes. Internally, they all form a clique. And externally, they all have the same non-zero pattern of four nodes. So the, the, the matrix looks like this. So I pick i. And then the next moment, J has the, node, blah, blah, blah. the node of least degree is the node of least degree, and then K has the node of least degree, and they all get eliminated together. But in the final analysis, they just create a clique of size 4 in the graph. And the whole purpose of the minimum degree algorithm is to minimize the size of the new clique that gets created. It's of size 4 by 4. It's of size 4, not, you know, what is it now? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So I've changed this now all the way to, have I miscounted? Wait, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, yes. So the degree of i is j and k in the, in the real graph without any node, supernode, indistinguishable, and all that jazz would be all six. But once i and j and k are folded together, their degree becomes four. Their external degree becomes four. Because that's what's interesting. That's what's useful, is that the annihilation of this, this group right here has the same impact on the remainder of the graph as if there was one node here of degree four. If it has the same impact, then I should have the heuristic say they're of the same quality of choice. So that's why the four is the number to choose on. The four is the metric that says, give me the best. Oh, that group has a quality of four. And there's another group here of quality seven. Its external degree is seven. So pick the four versus pick the seven. Okay, It's this metric here. This is, the met this is a better metric to use based on this observation than the true degree. Okay? Use the external degree, not the true degree. 
the true degree here is 4. So with, with I told you this is going to get complicated. Um, element absorption is to indistinguishable nodes, indistinguishable nodes. With indistinguishable nodes comes the notion of external degree. Not yet approximate. That's, we haven't gotten there yet. <sighs> okay. Now there's one more thing, mass elimination. This is sort of like a last minute detection of indistinguishability. <sighs> okay. How do you detect nodes that are dis indistinguishable in the first place is another story. But it can easily happen that you can have a node I and you have a node J and let's suppose your graph looks like this. Um, now you'd be hard pressed to say that node I has least degree. Uh, let's see. Uh, Trying to think if I can come up with an example without using the notion of approximate degree to justify this picture. Uh, let me not justify this picture. There's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a caveat here because if I eliminate node i, it's certainly of, of not of least degree. J is in this picture. Okay. Um, See if I can come up with a better example. One, two, three, four. Um, well, here's here's certainly one example. It's not it's not the uh, it's not the best example. It's, it's almost like a special case. But I, I look at I, and it's not next to J at all. And when I look for indistinguishable nodes, uh, you only, it, it's too expensive to look too far afield. The easiest thing to do is to, to look at your neighbor and say, are you the same as me? OK. Because uh, looking at I and J and saying they're the same is, is too hard to look through the whole graph and find these two pairs of nodes. But what happens when node i gets annihilated? Node i is a node of degree 3, and then it gets annihilated, and it gets replaced with the clique of its neighbors. And so if you will, this represent, this is what i now is. i is now a clique of those three in the quotient graph. And uh, then j is not in the clique, OK? But when I go through J, see J started out with, um, say AJ was a bunch of nodes. And EJ was, in this case, say was empty. So A was a, a next to three different nodes here. And it was next to no elements. Okay. Now, after the annihilation of I, we, we prune A. Okay, in pruning A, we prune all of the A's of these nodes. Okay, and so, um, mm. and we have to, let's see, we have to keep our graph symmetric. We have to, we have to prune the um, we're going to be pruning the uh, let's see how's this going to work J is not actually affected by this clique well this this example isn't quite working out because I'm trying to do three things at the same time Anyway, uh, let, let, let's just, I, I, let, let me 
let me do this. Let me just say the following. What can happen? What can happen is this. How we get here is another question. So here we have the rest of the graph. We annihilate node i and it becomes a clique. Suppose it becomes a clique that includes j. In my previous exa example, uh, um, didn't do that. But let's suppose this is what happens. Let's suppose I annihilate node i, and the moment I annihilate it, I, I have to update all my neighbors, which are four of them. And when I'm done with the, at the end of the day, I, I come and I find that at the end, after pruning a, I see that aj is empty. There's nothing there. And I say, I look that, and I see that ej is just i itself, the el eliminated node. Well, there's nothing left. There's nothing left of j. And if essentially what, what, what's happened is almost like a last minute indistinguishable detection. The fact that when i is eliminated, maybe that caused fill, and I pruned, say, this edge. And uh, I didn't notice that before. I'd have, to, I'd have to fabricate a larger example to, to make this work. So suppose this is what the graph was. I was adjacent to four nodes in the graph. And J was adjacent to these four. But they weren't identical. They weren't yet identical because J, um, J was adjacent to, to two, maybe to two. I and J were not identical. Uh, but when I is eliminated, this edge gets pruned because we trim from A anything. See, AJ does not need, when I gets eliminated as a pivot, we do not need in J an edge such as this. Right? An edge such as this that I drew over here on this chalk board. Yes, thank you. Uh, this edge is not needed anymore, right? Because I represents a clique of all these four nodes. So we don't need that node. So what's left of J is just this dangling thing. It's a dangling node. Now what happens if I pick J right now? Well, first of all, it's got to be a node of least degree because I was a, was a node of least degree. And the size of the clique is equal to the degree. I mean, that's how many nodes. The degree of I was four here. And four was the, node, was the degree of any nodes of least degree. The degree of J is now three in this graph. Because the degree doesn't include yourself. It's one less than the least degree of the previous step. So it's got to be the least in the whole graph. Furthermore, the annihilation of J creates a clique of its neighbors, but it's, that's already there. So poof, J can be chosen right now. And it is as if, it's like a last minute indistinguishable. It's like after I is picked and causes fill in, then it becomes indistinguishable with J, and then J goes away. So this is called mass elimination. It's a sort of last minute indistinguishable idea. Okay, so are you with me here? We have this notion of the quotient graph, which is a collection of original edges and cliques. Cliques are represented not by all the pairwise edges between them, but by a set that says, hey, you five nodes, you're in a clique. That's called, an, and we represent that with a, a, a new vertex in the graph called an element. So I have nodes and elements in the graph, two kinds of nodes. No edges between elements, but I can have node edges between nodes and between nodes and elements. So the graph is not bipartite. Bipartite graph would split into two sets of vertices here and here. See, I could have what I'm calling nodes, and I'm using ver node and vertex in a different sense now. I could have nodes on this side and elements on this side and edges between them. Well, no, because I've got edges between the nodes as well. But no edges between the elements. 
Okay, now there's one last thing, and I've got three minutes left in the class uh, to talk about the idea of now the degree. Well, the exact degree, and this is yet still now, this is now the exact external degree. Okay, because when I, when, when I and J get merged together, I just sort of goes away. It doesn't go away. We have to keep track of, oh, I eliminated I. Oh, no, yeah, yeah. At the moment, yeah, okay, J gets killed too. Okay, so I, J is just gone, except at the very, when I eliminate I, I have to just remember that it represents two nodes, not one. Okay, so this is the exact degree now, um, the size of this set. But this is, this is now is expensive to compute because going through and doing this pruning and finding, you know, removing and things like that, I would just have to go through the list A and I have to update the list J. So this is cheap. The, the time to, to modify the data structure here So the time to modify node i, i is now a node I must update. I eliminated node k, and I have to update it. The time to fix the graph of, I'm sorry, I'm reusing the notion of i, let me call this k, and this is now i. I have to update this piece of the graph for node i, and what I have to do is I have to go to all of its original connectivity and all of its elements. That's the time to fix the graph. And I've got to update the graph. So I've got to do this amount of work to fix the graph. I've got to walk through all of its original edges and prune them, which is just then decreasing. And I've got to then add a new thing to its element, delete elements that got dis eliminated by, by element absorption and such. So, and I've got to go through all the elements and then clean them up as well. OK, but here this is different. I've got to go through not only all the edges in the graph of A and prune those, but I've also got to go through this set here and then go yet further and take their set union. So that's expensive. And uh, if, if I draw a picture of this, you'll see how expensive it is. So I have I, and I've got to go through a sub i, and I must go through, so here's E1 and E2. Okay, there's the node i. And I've got two elements which are incredibly dense, let's say. The, this time complexity here, AI plus EI, would be five. Three nodes here, two nodes there. Okay? But now to compute this exact degree, we would have to go through the entire non-zero pattern of those two elements and take their set union. In other words, the degree of node I is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, counting these once. Four, you know, whatever, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 5. Something like that. I think I'm off by one. In other words, we need to take the set union of E1 and E2 here. Okay, that's expensive, and it would take time proportional to the degree to do that. So what if we just forgot this intersection? Let's ignore that. And that's this upper bound then. I could just take this upper bound on the set union is just the sum of the set sizes. And the set size I have is a single number, and I could just add it up. So this computation takes time proportional to this expression here. Or in, here, in this case, five. One, two, look, just look at those five things and just do it. And we get a very cheap bound on the degree. And then let's pick the node of least cheap bound. Well, that's faster, but it's the quality of the ordering suffers unacceptably. So this is not a good solution, even though it reduces the time to that desired time. What I'm going to show to you on Monday 
is this gnarly expression here, which looks on the outset very difficult to compute. There's set differences here that must be computed. And you're trying to get away from computing set unions, so I'm going to compute set differences, pairwise set differences instead. Oh my goodness, this looks just as hard as this. But guess what? This is as easy to compute as that. That's the surprise, that this much better bound, and I'll show you next class why this is a better bound, is much better in quality than this. It's closer to the exact degree. And it turns out that asymptotically you can compute this in the same time you compute that. And that's the surprising thing. Um, that, uh, and you can account for that set intersection there if the size of the degree, if, the, if, if, you have if you're adjacent to two elements. Anyway, so we'll pick, off, we'll pick up here looking at these different degree bounds. Now that we've seen how this graph is changing, now how we're going to do this in the algorithm is another story. But then we'll look at that. But we'll look then next class at the, at the degree. So I'll see you then. Thank you.